Hi everyone. Today we are going to talk about the implementation of EVPM VPLS over SRV6BE, which can be configured to carry EVPM VPLS over SRV6BE paths on a public network. EVPN is an extension of BGP EVPN, and from the perspective of the control plane, VPLS is a surface model. First, let's take a closer look at this surface model. Short for Virtual Private LAN Surface, VPLS is used to provide point to multi point L2 VPN services. By contrast, VPWS, which is short for Virtual Private Wild Surface, is used to provide point to point L2 VPN services. The figure on the left shows a typical example of VPLS networking. We can see that the intermediate layer 3 IP network simulates a layer 2 switch to which CEs are connected in order to exchange layer 2 data. The figure on the right shows the logical implementation of the VPLS network. Because the VPLS model has low performance requirements on CE devices and doesn't require the devices to support routing, it is cost-effective and widely used on live networks. The term uh, VPLS is defined by the IETF. In MEF and ITUT standards, it is referred to as ELAN. In this course, we'll refer to a network with five devices, P1, the P and the P2 belong to AS100. It's required that a bidirectional SRV6B path be deployed between P1 and P2 to carry EVP and VPLS. The main configuration roadmap consists of three steps. First, enable ISIS on P1, the P and the P2 to achieve basic root reachability. Then, deploy a bidirectional SRV6B path between P1 and P2. And finally, configure CE access to the PEs and establish an EVP and peer relationship between the PEs to transmit information between the CEs. For ease of understanding, we'll obtain packet headers from the two interfaces of P1 for packet parsing. Let's start by looking at how to configure ESIS, which consists of both global and interface specific configurations. Because ESIS configuration methods are practically the same across all SRV6B scenarios, they will not be described in detail. So, how do we configure SRV6? Specifically, we need to enable SRV6 globally and configure the source address for SRV6 encapsulation. In addition, in the EVP and VPLS scenario, we need to configure a broadcast, unknown unicast, and a multicast locator, also called a BOM locator. For this locator, the X field with the value of 8 needs to be set to prevent BOM traffic loops in CE dual homing scenarios. The 8 bytes occupied by the ARX field cannot be used to allocate seeds, resulting in a waste of address space. To resolve this problem, we can configure a unicast locator to make full use of the address space. We can also choose to only configure a BOM locator here. Because there are two locators configured, we need to run these two commands in the ISIS view to advertise locator routes. After SRV6 is successfully configured on P1 and P2, ISIS advertises SRV6 locators through LSPs. Now let's take a closer look at the format of an ISIS LSP carrying SRV6 information. Specifically, the ISIS LSP carries two pieces of locator information. We can also see that there are two locator routes advertised, one unicast route and one BOM route. According to its routing table, P1 has four locator routes, consisting of two routes belonging to P1 and another two belonging to P2. When observing the P's routing table, we can also see that the P has learned four locator routes. Next, let's see how to configure CE access on the P's and allocate C's to BD's. The first step involves configuring the C's. Typically, 
we need to configure the CE interface connected to a PE as a trunk interface, and the CE interface connected to a host as an access interface, and then add the two interfaces to the same VLAN. However, to facilitate subsequent packet forwarding verification through a ping operation between CEs, create a VLAN.1Q sub-interface on CE1, specify a VLAN10, and configure an IP address. The configuration on CE2 is similar to that on CE1. Moving on, let's configure the PEs. Specifically, create an EVPN instance working in BD or common mode and configure an RD and VPN target for the eVPN instance. Then create a BD and bind an eVPN instance to it, so that eVPN VPLS data is forwarded within the BD. Next, create a sub-interface and connect the PE to the corresponding CE through the sub-interface. In addition, specify a VLAN ID, which is the same as that specified on the CE, and add the sub-interface to the BD. We can also create multiple sub-interfaces and add them to the same BD. We now need to configure a unit cast seed and then a bomb seed for the BD under the locator. In addition, we need to specify a permitted VLAN for the corresponding sub-interface and bind the sub-interface to the BD. BDs need to be bound to the eVPN instances, allowing the PEs to exchange information through the instances. Let's look at the local seed tables generated on the PEs. P1's table shows that unicast and .dt2u and bomb and .dt2m seeds have been generated. Because the last 8 bytes of the bomb locator are allocated to the arx field, the corresponding seed is generated like this. From the seed table, we can see that each seed is bound to a BD. As such, the piece can associate the SRV6 seeds carried in packets with locally uh, configured BDs and forward the packets in the BDs. Now we need to establish a BGP EVPN peer relationship between the PEs to transmit routing information between the CEs. The peer enable command enables the device to exchange routes with the specified BGP EVPN peer. And the peer advertise in cap type command enables the device to advertise EVPN routes carrying SRV6 encapsulation attributes to its peer. These two commands are configured in the same way as those in the EVPN VPWS scenario. And the views where the commands need to be run are the same as those in the EVPN VPWS scenario. This indicates that EVPN VPLS and VPWS share the same EVPN peer relationship. We also need to configure root recursion. The two commands involved are also similar to those in the EVPN VPWS scenario. However, the corresponding views are different. In this example, we first need to perform root recursion to SRV6BE. Then configure the device to add the seed attribute to the BGP EVPN routes to be advertised. Because the EVPN VPLS scenario involves two locators, one unicast locator and one bomb locator, we need to specify two locators here. The final step involves configuring an EVPN source address for the corresponding PE. After the preceding configuration is complete, an EVPN peer relationship is established enabling the PEs to exchange eVPN routing information through update messages. Now let's examine the BGP update message format. The eVPN VPLS scenario involves two types of update messages, unicast and bomb. A unicast update message carries common pass attributes and an end.dt2u prefix seed. The eVPN NLRI shows that the main address family identifier is uh, L2VPN, the sub-address family identifier is eVPN, and the next hope is the address of P2. In addition, the root is a type 2 MAC uh, advertisement root. According to the detailed MAC root information, the root carries an RD and a CE2's MAC address. In contrast to unicast update messages, 
bomb BGP update messages carry the PMSI attribute, containing tunnel type, label, and destination address information. This attribute is mainly used for bomb traffic forwarding. The type of the carried BGP prefix seed is and.dt2m. According to the NLRI, we can see that the main address family identifier is L2VPM, the sub-address family identifier is EVPM, and the next hope is PE2. The root is a type 3 inclusive multicast root carrying an RD. Because a broadcast MAC address is used for packet forwarding in bomb scenarios, no specific MAC address is carried here. Next, let's look at a BGP EVPN routing table generated based on BGP update messages. Take P1 as an example. The command output shows type 2 MAC advertisement routes and type 3 inclusive multicast routes. Observing the type 2 MAC root details, we can see that the root carries a range of information, including the RD, next hope, RT, seed, and a specific MAC address. And according to the type 3 inclusive multicast root details, the root carries the PMSI attribute in addition to RD, next hope, RT, and seed information. Let's move on and check the ARP information on C1. The command output shows that C1 has learned C2's ARP information, which belongs to VLAN 10. And when we run the ping command on C1 to ping C2, the ping is successful, indicating that the configuration has succeeded. It's worth noting that the TTL value is 255, indicating that a virtual direct connection has been established between C1 and C2. After introducing the control plane implementation of EVP and VPLS over SRV6BE, let's see how packets are encapsulated during forwarding. In this example, a ping operation is initiated from C1 to C2 to simulate packet encapsulation. Assume that P1 receives a ping packet from C1. The packet is first encapsulated as an ICMP request, followed by IPv4 encapsulation, in which the source address is the address of C1 and the destination address is the address of C2. Then, 802.1Q VLAN encapsulation is performed on C1. After receiving the packet, P1 performs SRV6 encapsulation and sends it to P2. Looking at the encapsulation of this packet, we can see that only simple IPv6 encapsulation has been performed using P1's address as the source address and an end.dt2u seed as the destination address. No SRH is encapsulated, and the original data is transparently transmitted. Next, let's look at the reply direction from C2 to C1. Assume that P1 receives an SRV6 packet from P2. The source address of the packet is the address configured on P2, and the destination address is end.dt2uc of P1. The highlighted area displays the original data. After receiving the packet, P1 removes the SRV6 encapsulation and sends the packet to C1. According to the packet details, we can see that the packet is an ICMP reply, for which IPv4 encapsulation is performed on C2. The source address is the address of C2, and the destination address is the address of C1. Here is the 802.1Q VLAN tag added when P1 sends the packet to C1. As we reach the end of this course, let's summarize what we have learned. Firstly, to achieve ARP information transmission, we need to establish an AC connection between each CE and PE, and configure a BD to which multiple sub-interfaces associated with the CE are added. The BD needs to be bound to an EVPN instance, which is configured with RD and RT information. The corresponding routing information enters both the routing table of the EVPN instance and the EVPN routing table. 
EVPN routes, including Type 2 MAC advertisement routes and Type 3 inclusive multicast routes, are transmitted through the EVPN peer relationship between the PEs. After the communication channel on the public network is established, the CEs learn each other's ARP information through ARP requests and generate ARP entries. Moving on, let's look at the data forwarding process. Assume that CE1 sends an original IPv4 packet, encapsulated with an original VLAN tag to P1 through the interface bound to a BD. After receiving the packet, P1 finds the associated BD based on the packet's VLAN tag information, and then finds the associated ant.dt2u seed based on the BD. Then P1 performs SRV6 encapsulation. After the packet arrives at the P, the P searches the public network IPv6 routing table based on the outer destination address and forwards the packet to P2. After receiving the packet, P2 searches the local seed table based on the outer destination address and finds a matching end.dt2u seed. As instructed by the seed, P2 removes the IPv6 header, finds a matching BD, and forwards the packet to the specified AC interface in the BD. That's all for this course on EVPN VPLS over SRV6BE. Thank you for watching.